Since I moved to Worcester, lots of you have been in touch asking if I would share a story about the history of the city. You know, where to start? It's an old city, lots of Anglo-Saxon heritage here. 1651, we had the Battle of Worcester during the English Civil War. Uh, Prince Charles, Charles II, defeated by Oliver Cromwell, has to hide in an, in an oak tree, the original Royal Oak, the name of one of the most popular pubs in England. Uh, we've got King John and Magna Carta fame is buried in the cathedral just here. Uh, we've also got in the cathedral Arthur Tudor, elder brother of Henry VIII. England could have had a King Arthur and there would have been no Henry VIII. He would have just been Prince Harry, the spare. But I'm going elsewhere for today's story. I've come to Friar Street, fantastic street here in the city for our story today. Born in 1723, this person was the first woman to ever join the Royal Marines. She actually fought in action with them. Uh, she, hid her, she hid the fact that she was a woman as a secret. She was wounded in action. She was actually hit by a musket ball in the groin. And rather than a surgeon being able to find out, obviously, that she had no male appendage, she actually put her hands into the wound and dug around and found the musket ball herself and pulled it out. And her story is just an incredible one to tell. This is the story of Hannah Snell. From a young age, Hannah Snell was known to her neighbours as a bit of a tomboy. Nicknamed the Young Amazon Snell, she formed a regiment from the local children and used to parade them up and down Friar Street in Worcester. When she was 17, both of her parents died and Hannah, together with her younger siblings, moved to live with her older sister in Wapping, East London. Just four years later, she married a Dutch seafarer, James Summers. However, upon the birth of a daughter, Susanna, in 1745, he abandoned her. Just to add to the pain, Hannah's little daughter died after just five months. Once more, she moved in with her sister and brother-in-law, James Gray, in Wapping. As the year wore on, Hannah determined to find her near-do-well husband, although it's unclear as to whether she wanted him back or whether she was out for revenge. But how to find him? She believed, for reasons lost in the mists of time, that Summers had joined the army, and so she set off to find him. Arriving in the Midland city of Coventry in November 1745, she purchased some male clothes, assumed the name of her brother-in-law, and joined the army. Now, women impersonating men and joining the army was not something unique to Hannah Snell. I mean, a hundred years beforehand, during the English Civil War, King Charles I had banned women from wearing men's military uniforms. More recently, Christian or Kit Kavanagh had served with what were to become the Scots Greys. And of course, over the centuries, many women had followed the regiments, acting as cooks, seamstresses, nurses, even prostitutes. But Hannah can lay claim to a first, which you'll hear about in a while. Back to our story. It's November 1745. James Gray, aka Hannah Snell, has joined the 6th Regiment of Foot. It would later become the Royal Warwickshire Regiment, and later still the Royal Warwickshire Fusiliers, before finally becoming part of the present day Royal Regiment of Fusiliers. At the moment of James Gray's, or Hannah's, joining, the army had a fight on its hands. The Jacobite Rising, led by Bonnie Prince Charlie, was in full swing. Back in September, the Jacobite forces had routed a government army outside Edinburgh at the Battle of Preston Pans. The very month Hannah joined the 6th in Coventry, Bonnie Prince Charlie's forces had captured Manchester and were advancing on the Midlands. The Jacobite forces eventually reached Derby before deciding to retreat back to Scotland. Uh, there's a bit more to that one sentence, but that will do for this story. Hannah, as part of the 6th Regiment of Foot, followed the retreating Jacobite army and ended up at Carlisle Castle. It was here that she ran foul of her sergeant, who ordered James Gray to receive 500 lashes for insubordination. You would think that stripping off her shirt for a whipping would reveal Hannah's secret, but somehow she managed to avoid detection. Partly, as she later confided, because she had very small breasts, and partly because she faced the gate of the castle, so only her back was exposed to the soldiers drawn up on parade to witness the punishment. Maybe not surprisingly, Hannah Snell deserted shortly afterwards. You can hardly blame her. But incredibly, she headed to Portsmouth on the south coast of England and enlisted in the Royal Marines. And the military were only too happy to take on anyone daft enough to join, as Britain, apart from the Jacobite Rising, was also engaged in a major European war. In this war of the Austrian succession, Britain was in an alliance that pitted her against a rival alliance led by Spain and Britain's oldest enemy, France. 
Whilst the war was principally fought in Europe, in fact, during this war, King George II would be the last British monarch to personally lead their troops into battle. It was also fought anywhere where the British and French, as well as Spanish interests, collided in the world. And hence, Hannah Snell, under a pseudonym of uh, James Gray, sailed for the Indian Ocean. Once again, she managed to keep up her male identity. Shaving her hair off, which many sailors and soldiers did to avoid lice, Hannah was able to blend in with the rest of the ship. Despite never having to shave her face, her Royal Marine comrades didn't suspect anything, and instead they ribbed her about her youthful feminine looks, nicknaming James Grey Miss Molly Grey. <laughs> of course, the joke was on them, as you're going to hear in a while. As part of her male presence, Hannah even flirted with ladies in taverns to sort of deflect awkward questions. And it seems that her youthful looks were a hit with some of those ladies, and she narrowly avoided having to marry one of them. On board HMS Swallow, she was part of a convoy commanded by Admiral Edward Boscoin that sailed for the Cape of Good Hope in modern-day South Africa. From there, the British fleet headed to the French island of Mauritius in the Indian Ocean. For four days in June 1748, the British sailed around the island, seeking an undefended place to land their 1,400 troops. But in the end, the Admiral decided the French possession was too well defended. As we've just seen, the British were happy to take the French head-on where the opportunity existed, away from the European war. But alongside this direct conflict, the two sides involved local allies in proxy wars too. And it was to one of those proxy wars that Admiral Boscoin now headed. At this time, the British and French were vying for influence and control in India and had taken opposing sides in an Indian conflict known as the First Carnatic War. With their Indian allies, the British laid siege to the French colony of Pondicherry, which is about 100 miles south of their own base at Madras, now called Chennai. It was here that Hannah and the rest of the Royal Marines landed and went into action in August 1748. The siege lasted until October, when, with weather conditionings worsening due to the monsoons, the British were forced to withdraw. Just before Christmas, a ship arrived from England, bringing the news that a peace treaty had been signed back in Europe. Peace there might be in Europe, but there was little peace in India. Those rival Indian rulers had their own power struggles, and they were keen to bring in the French and British to gain an advantage over their rivals. In 1749, the Second Carnatic War broke out in southern India. Once more, the British and French were drawn into supporting their allies. In June of that year, the British landed to seize the fort of Devikota, about 37 miles south of Pondicherry. Hannah Snell, or James Gray, was part of a force of 800 British and 1,500 Indian sepoys under the command of Major Stringer Lawrence, who laid siege to the fort. After a three-day bombardment, the British attempt to storm the fort, led by an enthusiastic young officer from the East India Company, called Robert Clive, was beaten off. Lawrence launched a fresh assault, and included in the very first line of his attack was James Gray, our Hannah Snell. In her autobiography, she claims to have fired 37 rounds with her musket, hitting several defenders. However, she herself was hit by musket balls in the legs, and more seriously, in the groin. This injury presented Hannah Snell with her greatest danger keeping her cover. If a surgeon operated on her groin, he would spot the lack of male appendage. So, Hannah took herself off and with the help of a local Indian woman, operated on herself. Forcing her fingers deep into her wound, she was able to locate the musket ball and then remove it. Incredibly, she survived this ordeal with her cover as James Gray totally intact. Along with other wounded servicemen, James Gray was sent back to England to be pensioned off. Upon his arrival, James Gray was drinking with his comrades in a tavern when he declared, Why, gentlemen, James Gray will cast off his skin like a snake and become a new creature. And he then shared his secret, that he was actually a she. Far from being outraged, the Royal Marines were impressed, although I guess they might have been a tad surprised as well. In fact, they were so impressed that they urged James, now Hannah again, to lobby for the army pension, that she, as a wounded soldier, fully deserved. And so, with their encouragement, she approached the head of the army, the Duke of Cumberland. As the King's son conducted a review of troops in St James's Park, London, he was confronted by a woman who had worn the King's uniform and had seen active service for her country over 250 years before it was officially allowed. The Duke of Cumberland, a man who'd earned the fearsome nickname the Butcher of Culloden, granted her request. 
Hannah Snell was given an honourable discharge from the army and in November 1750 was awarded a pension of £18 and 5 shillings a year from the Royal Hospital Chelsea. Deciding not to reside at the hospital and become a Chelsea pensioner, she became what was termed an out-pensioner and spent her retirement out in the big wide world. Her story became a sensation. Her autobiography, The Female Soldier, became a bestseller and she became a star on the West End stage. Her show involved Hannah appearing on stage in her uniform and carrying out military drills for the audience. With her financial windfall and fame, Hannah returned to Wapping and opened a pub called The Female Warrior. Although there are some suggestions it was called The Widow in Masquerade, which is an equally cool title. Her business skills, however, didn't seem to match her martial skills, and the venture was short-lived. Sometime during her incredible life journey, Hannah found out that her husband, James Summers, had been executed for murder in Italy. So, she went on to marry twice more and had to lease two children. In the summer of 1791, her mental health had taken a downward turn, and she was admitted to the Bethlehem Hospital in London, more often called Bedlam. It was here on the 8th of February 1791 that Hannah Snell died, aged 49. As a former soldier and pensioner, she was buried at the Royal Hospital, Chelsea. In October 2018, the Ministry of Defence changed its policy to allow women to serve in all combat roles in the British Armed Forces. 270 years beforehand, Hannah Snell had been in a British redcoat and fought in two battles. Now, Hannah Snell was not the first woman to ever fight in a battle. She was not even the first British woman to fight in a battle. Nor was she the first woman to be buried at the Royal Hospital at Chelsea. That honour belongs to Christian Kit Kavanagh, who I mentioned earlier. But here is her first. Hannah Snell can lay claim to being the first woman ever to serve, and certainly to be recognised as serving, in the Royal Marines. Not bad for the young girl from Friar Street in Worcester. Well, thanks for joining me today, and I hope you enjoyed that story. It's a little bit different from some of my more recent ones. And if you enjoy my work, then why not join my supporters club and get a free copy of my timeline of British history? There's a link in the description. Plenty of stories still to come, but in the meantime, thanks for your support. Keep well, and I look forward to joining you again very soon. <laughs>